from the consultative group to assist the poor, CEO Greta Bull and the CEO of Solar Home Systems Provider Mobisol, Thomas Gottschalk. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, and, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Greta Bull. My name is Thomas. Nice to see you. And uh, we're managing this conversation ourselves now. So um, I, I would, I thought I would kick off. Um, I'm with the consultative group to assist the poor, which is also known as CGAP. Uh, we specialize in access to finance and digital financial services in particular. And we've been very um, actively interested in the off-grid electric and other PAYGO spaces for a long time. And the reason that we're excited about it is it brings together a lot of different things that are of interest to us. Um, so it brings together um, distribution and payments, which is really important. It brings credit to the table, data and data analytics. But most importantly, it brings to the table something that poor people really want. It's really hard to convince poor people to take insurance in a vacuum. People want electricity. People want the things that electricity brings them. Um, and these three things coming together for us is really exciting because it opens up opportunities in consumer finance, microfinance, um, and the opportunity to give people access to electricity. So um, perhaps we can start by talking a little bit about Mobisol and how these things come together in your business model. Great, Greta. Um, when, when, when I started Mobisol eight years ago, I was fascinated about reducing carbon. And uh, so that was one of my main motivations, uh, to bring solar to the people who normally cannot afford it. And um, we saw that solar prices went down. We saw that mobile money was implemented. And um, so bringing those two revolutions together actually was an interesting way to, to start Mobisol with a focus of bringing access to electricity. Um, over the last seven years, actually, what, what I saw and what fascinated me was that energy is the first step into development. It's the first step for many, many people to say, well, we now have electricity, I want to do productive use. So we see that a third of our 120,000 customers is uh, using their system for productive use. And um, more and more people come to us and say, well, can we use our system as a collateral? Can we use our data, which you collected, that we are actually um, people who pay back a loan so that we are reliable um, loan customers, can we use that to go to the next MFI or to go to the next bank to actually show them that we are reliable customers? And actually it goes one step ahead. The solar system which they own then after three years becomes a collateral. And you know, suddenly you have a, a household in rural Africa or rural Pakistan or rural India who has a collateral, which is not a cow or which is not, um, you know, it's real collateral. You can have uh, an ex exact um, estimation of what the, the residual value of is it, and you can use that as a, as a guarantee for the next loan. And that's financial inclusion in its best, I think, right? So to use data, to use solar, which is an enabler which we really enjoyed when, uh, um, when it came to Europe, when it came to the States, and um, suddenly you have this financial inclusion and access to finance through access to electricity. Yeah, we've been really excited about that as well. Um, and CGAP's done some work on using that collateral to develop new products. For example, we worked with Phoenix Energy in Uganda to help them develop an education loan product that sat on the back of a solar home system, which used it as collateral. So it was giving people yet a further step of something that they needed using financial services. Yeah. What other use cases is Mobisol looking at building on top of this kind of trifecta of payments, credit, and um, electricity. Yeah. Um, we, we just launched uh, in, in January our, our software business. Actually, it's a fintech. Um, it's focusing on enabling other DESCOs or even MFIs um, to go into the access to energy sector. And again, what we figured out, it's access to energy, A to E. But actually, after energy, everything comes. So it's access to everything. And um, we are working at the moment with a, a tractor producer to have an, a pagey tractor. So if the customer doesn't pay for the tractor, the tractor is off, right? And this is what we will see as in the future, that you can finance everything which has a circuit board inside. And um, we have fridges, we have a welding machine, we, have, um, we are developing an um, a ice machine which makes one kilogram, uh, one, one ton of ice every day. So basically as a start for the cold chain, right? So Rachel mentioned the cold chain um, as, an, as an issue, but you know, if you want to, preserve fish or other um, food, y y you, need you need to have an, an, an 
a refrigerator. And so all of that is now possible through efficient solar appliances and as an enabler for businesses to grow, right? So now you don't have to sell your fish the first day, but you can wait actually until you find somebody who gives you a little bit more money for your, for your catch. And um, that's, again, that's a development which I didn't foresee seven years ago. For me, it was about solar, it was access to energy, it was carbon um, reduction. Um, but it is um, such a beautiful um, vehicle to actually see development, so real, real development. So development which is coming from the people themselves. It's not development come from the outside and say, well, now here you have to do this business or something. It's like an enabling development, which uh, I think is going to be a very sustainable development. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And one of the things I really like about the, the solar home system space and, and the ability to make micro payments is that it actually puts control in the hands of the consumer. Um, and it empowers the consumer in terms of being able to leverage that, that control into other things. Um, one of the things that we've seen about the Pago space is that it, it scales really well. So it's very similar to digital financial services compared to microfinance. So you can get scale a lot faster. But what do you see as some of the challenges or some of the limitations to growth from your experience? Um. For me, the scaling was always the interesting part, right? 1.5 billion people without electricity. So I thought, if we can develop a product which is stable, which is financeable, which the people want, we can have a massive impact. And um, so we now have a product which is very stable, um, which the people want. Um, what we still see as a massive issue is uh, regulations. Mm -hmm. So coming to, to countries and um, trying to have a stable business environment where you can really rely that what you do today is still valid the next day or the next week. Um, what we see as well, and um, I'm very grateful for certain initi initiatives to take care of that, is um, a workforce which is has the right skill set because um, it's extremely difficult to work in the, s in the surroundings where we are. And then if you have as well the challenge of not finding colleagues which have the right skill set, it makes it extremely difficult. So um, we have our own academy um, where we train um, people, but it's, you know, you need to have a certain skill level before you can enter the sector as well. So this is something um, which more and more people are focusing on to provide an education level, which then enables um, people to, to join DESCOs actually. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because um, Nick Hughes used to be a member of our board and I remember talking to him about that. As you expand, being able to find the skills to grow the business was a challenge from his perspective as well. And, and that kind of brings me to another question that I'd love to hear your views on is, you know, th these Pago companies are interesting because they're kind of a mashup between an energy services company or a, a distribution company and a credit company. And those are two really different skill set. And, and, and those two businesses have very different balance sheets. Um, and we've done some work on, on trying to describe and define how those balance sheets maybe should be separated so that investors can understand them. But what are the skills that, that you really need to grow the business, um, especially as you move into new markets? And is, is access to financing a challenge as you get into more let's say exotic markets and exotic currencies than, than you know, the markets that you've started in. Um, I know a lot of fintechs, for example, have really struggled with um, local currency debt financing, particularly as you go into markets like the DRC or Zambia or Malawi. And so how much of that is a constraint as well for you? You know, it's a little bit how you define exotic. Um, Tanzania compared to Germany is pretty exotic already. Um, I think there was a development over the last 12 months where a few existing DESCOs could actually cooperate with banks. Like MCOPA uh, has a, a cooperation with Standing. We have a cooperation with CIDB in Tanzania. And I think us together, we have a, a volume over $60 million in local currency financing on okay terms. It's not fantastic terms, but they are okay. So um, we will be, or that will be a blueprint, a blueprint for other banks and other countries to say, well, you know, we have to maybe adjust the risk and the, the currency um, fluctuation, but actually we, we can go into the local currency lending. And um, I, I think it's, it's not solved yet, but it's on a very good path to be solved um, because we have really good um, examples, stable examples, which can be replicated. And the, the reason why we sp spun off our software to make it actually available to all DESCOs uh, on the market we have solid experience over the last seven years in setting up everything from the distribution company to the 
energy, electricity, maintenance provider to the credit provider. And we made so many mistakes, we made so many learnings, which we agglomerated in that software, which we are now giving actually to, to third parties to say, well, if you concentrate on the front office, the sales and after sales, that's so much headache already. We take care of the credit check, we take care of the, the products, so it's, it's product agnostic, the software. We take care of everything what happens in the back office so that you can really concentrate on the heavy, heavy work every day on uh, enabling that people have access to the products and that the products are maintained. But I I so credit risk is important in this, but also market risk is really a challenge. And a couple of years ago, a number of African currencies took a really big dive. And uh, at least in the fintech sector, that was a very big challenge. So how much of that is a challenge for you? And how are investors helping um, to solve that challenge for companies like you to be able to grow often across you know, a continent with 48 different countries, different currencies, and challenges to scale? Um, we had the, the unfortunate situation that uh, just before the an equity round in 2015, we saw the Tanzanian shilling diving by 25%. So it was not the, the best argumentation for our future investors to say, well, we have a, a secure and interesting business. Um, again, the local currency will help us. Um, we have to price in the cost for it towards uh, the customer. Um, there's the hedging you know becomes maybe more and more interesting we have a very absurd situation in, in 2017 where we lost i think four and a half million dollars in, in currency because of uh, president trump right it was not the local currencies which devaluated it was the dollar which devaluated so every hedge between the dollar and the local currency would have not helped us it was a dollar and the euro which gave us a huge uh, headache and um so I think the, the currency issue will be actually an issue for the, the coming years to be to be solved. So I, I don't think that um, with all different currencies, we, we buy part of our, cust uh, our product in, in China. So the, um, the RMB had an issue as well with the devaluation or, uh, to, towards the dollar. And um, so this is, I think, a risk which needs to be priced in. Yeah, and, and I think there's a lot that the investment community here can do to sort of help companies like yours to address some of those risks. Um, on the credit risk side, we've been, um, we've been increasingly concerned in some of the markets that you're in in East Africa about over-indebtedness. So we did, uh, uh, particularly around digital credit, which is a product that's growing in parallel with yours and very, very popular, um, particularly in East Africa. Um, very short-term loans, very high interest rates and pretty high default rates. Um, how is that impacting your business? Do you see risk um, on the horizon? We, we saw an increase in default uh, in 2016, 2017 early, um, mainly based on the drought, which we saw in East Africa. So um, we, Mobiso is extremely strict with its credit business. So we have not been scaling as fast as our competitors because it is not as easy um, to get a solar home system with, um, with Mobiso as it might be with one of our competitors. Um, there was a workshop today around um, customer protection principles from Google, which is in parallel to that session, so I, I couldn't join. But it is extremely important for us for a sustainable approach. Right? We, we have now 120,000 customers. So there's an, another 100 million customers waiting out there. So if we screw it up now with a relatively low amount of customers, we will not reach this, this beautiful scaling um, opportunity because people will say, no, solar home systems, it's over uh, indebtedness and um, they don't work from a, from a customer financing path. So we, we as a sector have to be extremely cautious around the, 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 the credit of, you know, the credit worthiness of our customers and that we ensure that they can actually pay back. Otherwise, you know, we had an exciting first decade in that sector, but then it will, um, be demolished by uh, a bad reputation in, in the sector. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing about, or, or another interesting thing about the business that you're in is it's really closely involved in partnerships. So you are delivering um, solar devices, but you also are delivering finance, but you rely on mobile network operators to deal with payments and a lot of the distribution of funding. How, how would you like to see those partnerships evolving? and, and what would help your business to grow with respect to those kinds of partnerships? Well, the truth is without mobile money, there would be no Mobisol, there would be no Beatbox, there would be no Mcopa. So this was the beauty of an existing solution, an existing revolution which took place when we came to the market. Um, 
I think the problem which the, the MNO said with the off-grid providers is we, we were always very small with our volumes, with our requests, so we never really got the, the right attention to say, well, you know, let's think about that five years, ten years down the plan. How can we structure a product which is good for you, which is good for 10,000 systems, which is good for 10 million systems? And um, so if you're lacking support, you have to be innovative. That's the beauty, beautiful thing about entrepreneurship, right? That you can be creative, that you have to think about problems and have to come up with solutions. There are many startups, many fintech startups, which are offering mobile money alternatives to the MNOs. Um, we have been working on a, um, on a device which we can use data transfer uh, from the system back to our database so we know the health of our systems. So I think that's, you know, if you have challenges, you will have to come up with um, solutions. And um, the challenge that we were too small for the MNOs in the first years of our existence mm. brought us to, I think, more independence from the MNO. So we, we don't need them anymore uh, as, as a partner. We happily work with them because it's a beautiful cooperation. It's such, it's so full of synergies. So it would be sad if we would not use that, but it's, we are not forced to use them. So it's a risk mitigation. It was important for our investors to say, well, what if uh, Vodacom or Airtel is, is cutting uh, or taking the plug out? Um, wha what do you do then? Um, um, so we, we needed to, to work on that on that alternative routes to um, ensure that our business is viable. And that actually in the end brought the cost down. And if you're talking about cost, our customers are not rich, right? So they have to pay for everything. We are not grant funded. All of our money is commercial. Well, from the 100 million um, euros which we, we raised, I think 2.4 million is grant money. So the substantial amount uh, is, well, the, the, the vast amount is, uh, is commercial um, money. We have to ensure that our customers actually can pay for their service, right? We cannot lose the, a customer, so that the customer is defaulting. So we have to ensure that our service is as cheap as possible, right? We are there, we're not there yet, right? We are still serving the, the rich of the poor, right? We are not, if you look at the, the economic pyramid, we are not down there yet. We are somewhere in the middle. But which each and every day, which even every system which we install, we get more experience. We understand better. Okay, here we can save a few cents. I had an interesting, um, an interesting thought. I came here with uh, with Ryanair, right? And there's so many things missing which you normally know happen, uh, which are part of an airplane, right? But they're missing because they're not necessary to come from Berlin to Lisbon, right? And that makes it cheaper and cheaper. So I think we see a similar uh, development in Mobisol as as Ryanair has shown. If you really want to have access to electricity, cut it to the essential. Cut it to what the people can afford actually and want to afford. And that's what we have done over the last six, seven years. And that's what we would like to actually now share with other um, companies and, and markets to say, look at the essential because the price is going to be the most important thing as well for over indebtedness, right? If you can come in with a lower price, it will be easier for the customers to, to pay it back. And I think there are also interesting opportunities around partnerships with the mobile network operators. And, and I think they've been sort of struggling with integrating third parties. Um, we've certainly been advocating for them to play the role of platforms. And the GSMA has recently come out with really important evidence saying that the best mobile network operators, the ones that have the highest use rates, the ones that are most profitable, are ones that act as platforms. So they integrate bank partners, they integrate bill pay partners, they integrate merchants. And I think there's a growing realization um, from their side that they need to be easier to work with. They need to have open APIs so that it's easy for small companies to be able to integrate and, and deliver services over their payments rails. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. But, and, oh, and, and they need to have interoperable solutions, right? So that you don't have, somebody doesn't have to go to their provider of mobile financial services to make a payment. They can go to any provider of mobile financial services to make a payment. And that's particularly true in rural areas um, because serving the poor in rural areas is really hard, including for mobile network operators. So uh, finding ways to kind of build different use cases on top of, of what they're already providing in terms of payments, in terms of digital credit, in terms of Pago Solar, um, it's gonna be important for their business case too. Um, how how do you feel like um, you're doing on the last mile connectivity? You said that you're reaching kind of the, the rich of the poor. What's going to take to get to the poor of the poor? Um, maybe two, three years um, to be more efficient. So when we started, our batteries had a, a lifetime expectations of three years. Now we are at eight years, 
right? Eight years lifetime expiration of, of battery. When I started, I bought a, a solar panel for, I think, 74 cents a, a watt peak. Now we buy them for uh, around 30 cents a watt peak. So um, there's a natural degradation of, of price um, coming, which will be very supportive to reach the poorer uh, uh, in, in, the, in the pyramid. But at the same point, through scaling, you know, you have your maintenance technician and the maintenance technician, she or he, can service 10 people or 100 people in that area. So it's going to be through the scaling uh, as well, just cheaper to offer the service to, um, to more and more people. Um, I'm, I know I'm a big fan of innovation because I've seen what innovation brought to Mobiso over the last seven years. And um, so I, I'm, I'm very sure. And um, the, the speaker before us said by 2030, the energy access problem will be solved. I'm, I, I will sign that in, maybe even already 2028. Um, because of innovation and um, because of sexiness of the product. And um, so I, I don't have to be convinced that we have a solution on hand which can be scaled. So we are not 100% ready yet, but I would say we are at 85, 86%. Um, give us a little bit more and then we will actually have product we will have a, a product which can be used for cooking. So that was requested uh, um, that will be coming into the market in two years, which will be extremely efficient and um, yeah, be one of the solutions which many people have looked for for a long time. Great. I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lev.